We often talk about folks whose walk matches their talk. Um, in this case, um, Bill's walk matches his song. Uh, he is one of those guys that uh, lives his faith very, very honestly and authentically. And I don't see Dave Bunton back there. I'm assuming he went home to be with his bride who had surgery, but I wanted to mention the Rob. We have one of the kingpins of the extreme build here. He goes, he's the early team guy. He's gone for, I don't know, as long as I've been here, he's been going. So, and we've had a few of our other folks who've done that. So it is a delight to have that mentioned again. And I did not bring pictures, but uh, there are many to be found of this new baby of Cassandra's. And uh, I will bring them next week. I have them on my phone, but I'll put them on the board for you. But uh, she's dressed ridiculously pretty. And so uh, just know that uh, there is trouble coming down the pike. That's what I see for them. No, good trouble. We have journeyed with this book. And if you have not bought one, take one anyway. Um, just take it. And the only thing I ask is that you take it and that you read it. We've made enough copies available for everybody, and you can quickly get caught up. It's not a difficult read, uh, but let me just encourage you. This is week three, and I'm going to give you a quick overview. Chapter one, I will be a functioning church member. There are certain factors, but we look at things honestly and personally. It's about choices. Small choices lead to big choices. And in the world in which we live, in the church commitment that we make oftentimes, we, I think we're minimizing uh, the importance of the local church. It is the body of Christ. And also, we need to have uh, higher expectations of our members, and that's why I brought that little card to you. And I hope that you will fill that out. You will fill it out and add something to your... Very few of you, I could go around this room and have you stand and talk about where you serve in this church. And most all of us have something that we do, quarterly, monthly, whatever it might be. But how about that week-to-week -week kind of commitment that would lend itself uh, to a freshness of your own ministry? And so Tom Rayner says, his advice is, church members need to look in the mirror because church members expect service without giving it. And so chapter 2 is, I will be a unifying church member. And the premise of this is, in fact, that once we become a Christian, God not only expects, but he demands that we be unifiers. And that doesn't mean you can't disagree. We talked about that last week. But we are never to be a divisive force. And we talked last week about the audacity of, of a cord being connected together. We talked about the taming of the tongue, and we talked about the incredible fuel of forgiveness and how that provides for us that kind of chemistry and glue that we desperately need. Today I've gone from just talking about nice subjects to really preaching. <laughs> this one Ill, will get up in your grill, so to speak. This is chapter 3, and it says, I will not let my church be about me. My preferences and my desires. Whew, mercy, alive. Two opening premises of the chapter are this. He said, we are not unlike children sometimes who have temper tantrums and fall on the floor and wrestle. I saw one of those yesterday with our two-year-old grandson. I was able to perfectly calm him down and, and, and meet him on a level of manhood to manhood that, no, I wasn't. It was awful. It was just awful. And secondly, the strange thing about church membership is that you actually give up preferences when you join. Now, I know, just kind of swallow that, because that's a lot to swallow for some folks. And the reason we give up our preferences is that we are, in fact, here to serve, to give, and, in fact, to sacrifice. The first 12 who hung out with Jesus, who had a close relationship with him, they even got it confused on occasions. You know, remember they said... Who will be the greatest, Jesus? Who will be the greatest? In other words, what, what seat will I get to sit in? Will I get to sit closest to you? you know, the who will be the greatest? And he just, in fact, destroyed that. He says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. It's important that you and I remember that that is the premise under which we serve with each other here. So 
to create a backdrop of the kind of serving that Jesus, in fact, is talking about, there is a key, absolutely deep-seated key passage from uh, Paul that talks about this. And we're going to look at that. If you've got your folder, want to follow along, this is, I would call it the granddaddy theological passage about attitudes and how, in fact, this incredible thing happened when Jesus became man, uh, God became man, and he emptied himself in order to be that. The big theological word is kenosis. In other words, he emptied himself. And it was a profound thing. In your relationships with one another. Notice it right off the bat. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And here's that passage that you've been around the church, you've heard. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is, in fact, above every name, and all the name, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So let's dive in. First of all, the joy of serving. And I will tell you that if you have not worked your way to the joy part of serving that I would invite you to kind of something's not right because early on the more you give your life away in service to others now I know people can take advantage of you I had a young man came in this morning uh, started uh, making the rounds of asking uh, our members for money I've made it fairly clear to anybody that comes to our church on Sunday Sunday is a day that we worship now, if there's been a catastrophe or there's been something that I, I can deal with there, but, but this gentleman I've, know, I've known, he, he seems to need when he knows we're in the building. And so I made it very clear to him. We worship on Sunday. If you want to talk to, about some needs in your life, I certainly will try to do my best there. But the joy, of suffer, the joy of serving is important. Why? Well, Scripture. Servant occurs 58 times in the New Testament. And the verb serve has another 58 times there. So 57 and 58. Um, and so if you and I want to think about our preferences in the local church and we read the New Testament, then ultimately we have to dropkick this whole idea of me first. It just, it just takes care of that. Paul said it perfectly. We've been reading Ephesians, at least we did a couple weeks ago in our Wednesday night study. I was made a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. In other words... The conclusion is that you and I, we will never find any significant joy in being a part of the body of Christ. Yes, even signing that document that says we are going to be a church member unless we are constantly seeking ways to serve others. And we will find our greatest joy when we do that. Now, does that mean that you won't get kicked in the teeth along the way? Does that mean that everybody will appreciate it? No, it really does not. It does not. But we do it, not because we want the accolades of others around us, but because we ultimately serve a, an audience of one, and that is Christ. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much criticism I receive or how much adulation I receive. At the end of the day, it is about how I sense God's approval in my life. Yesterday, all of you should know, if you don't know already, that Betty McCoy, and we had her funeral. And there, of all the weeks that I could be talking about serving, we're talking, you know, I talked about Betty McCoy yesterday. And she, if you want to look serving Christ up in the dictionary, look it up and you will see her picture. <laughs> she was an incredible lady who invested her life in so many of the right things. Tom Rainer put a, a search team together, a research team. He, he's big on research. And, and they came out with what he called 10 behavioral patterns for churches that in fact struggle. Now fortunately we have none of these in our church. We have absolutely none of these. Of course we do. <laughs> we do. Of course we do. But you get to guess which ones we struggle with and you get to uh, identify those. So we're going to look at them. I renamed them a little bit but number one is the worship wars. Now we've talked about that. I have expressed it to you. 
I even pulled out an old message I did on worship as music and looked and made sure that uh, I wasn't saying anything different to you. Because in that message, I talked about how in a very real sense, you know, we go over here to King's Island and we expect them to, to some level, amuse us. Now, we don't do that in the church, but there is some parallel in that the church ought to be a place when it is that we enter worship, that there ought to be a part of us that wants to be engaged. And entertainment, amusement, whatever you want to put over there for just, a, you know, for just kicks is one thing, but to be in, in, engaged for Christ's sake on, in a worship setting, now that's the powerful stuff. And so... Uh, we have to be careful about how we perceive our preferences in relationship to music. Let me give you a couple ideas. Worship is about access and response. It's about finding access to God and responding to that. And I will tell you that there is no style of music that limits my ability to do that except my own personality. Now, I'm not wearing a tie today because I'm more comfortable with a tie because I've, used, I've had a tie on most every time I've preached that my whole life. But some of you have kidded me about summer being here, and we've, we've kind of doing a blended service now. Why don't you kind of loosen up? But I took it off, and three people said, well, yeah, why don't you have a tie on today? <laughs> and one of them saw me being abused so much, she came over to me afterwards. She said, Dan, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but it's just kind of our preferences. I prefer it. I prefer a more, a, probably a little bit more organy and you know some of that traditional stuff too i mean I, that's not but it's not about my preferences it really is not worship is about having a conversational rhythm with god where god speaks and we listen are we listening and where we sing and god listens so if you didn't sing how can god listen worship of god is about our access and our need to respond to God's urgings in our lives. Secondly, the minutia meetings. Now, I will just say, outside of a handful of meetings in my seven years with you, we don't have a lot of minutia meetings here. We don't, and I thank God for it. But boy, those handful, whoo-wee, they're just awful. Why? Because humanity gets in there and it gets all messed up. We have a very clear structure. We have a leadership team. We have quarterly meetings, and we have done very well there. So thirdly, facility focus. Facility, uh, this facility, to me, has the perfect balance. It is a beautiful facility, and yet it's also, even in spite of its age and all the things there, we have done incredibly well to utilize this building. You come into this building any day of the week. Every night, I think all but one during the week, almost regularly, is used in this building. We have Alcoholics Anonymous. We have Overeaters Anonymous. We have Tai Chi. We have uh, Zumba. You got to be in the building when that's going on. <laughs> Zumba, Zumba, whatever it is. Um, we, obviously, we have, we have weddings for non-members. We have the Family Nurturing Center that comes here with court-ordered folks that they handle on Mondays and Tuesdays. I mean, we fill this building. And that's our intention, is to be a facility that is not focused on what we only can do, but what we can, in fact, do for our community. On a regular basis, our front lawn, our parking lot are used for activities of our community. We are getting ready to have the Vietnam Memorial moved, Vietnam Veterans Memorial moved to the corner of our lot here uh, because we believe we want to participate in the community because it's right now it's sitting behind Mike and Field and nobody really sees it regularly. Fourthly, program driven. Reigns makes a distinction between ministries and programs. Ministry is something that meets people's needs, meets people's needs, and it's a good thing. It's kind of an or organic thing that just kind of out there meeting needs, and then it becomes a program. You know what happens when you become a program? If you try to change it, people chop your fingers off. You know, it just, no, you can't change that. No, you can't change it. Let me get two of the ministries in our church right now that I can highlight. Betty McCoy came to me. She's been our, our librarian for all these years. She came to me a number of years ago, and what she did that day was give me permission to transition the library, but I haven't touched it yet. But I've talked to many of you about it, that 
it's just not utilized anymore, and so it's time to utilize that space a little better. And about the same time, one of the other more successful ministries of our church that, that, that resists becoming a program is Operation Christmas Child. And so I've already had, they were going to be transitioning from Doris's basement. Uh, I believe that it started in Doris's basement and has been there all these years. And I'm not going to say that some of the ladies can't go downstairs anymore, but some of them complained to me about all those steps. And so, anyway, in, in, a, in the right time, in the right way, now we're beginning to transition that ministry here with Doris's permission. Although she was walking the building the other day with a really long stick. So I'm not sure what that will mean down the road, but it's out there. All I say that is that if something is a ministry, it's not about a personality. It's about what that ministry does. And both of those ministries, one of them has kind of lost its um, connection in a society in which we live, but the other one certainly is still vital. Inward budget. We have to access this regularly, and we do it as a team. But when we went through the strategic leadership team process a couple years ago, one of the things that we did was we added initiative ministry items in our budget. Now, we've trimmed some of those back, but we are, in fact, looking every year that we're not just spending money on ourselves, that we're making sure we try to keep that arm of our budget money outside the building. Sixth, privilege prompts. If you've ever seen the commercial, the credit card commercial, membership has its privileges. Well, the privilege ought to be that we give you opportunity to serve. And this one, of course, leads to the next one, what I call entitlement abuse. Now, I'll be honest with you. I am, by my very nature, an accountability guy. By my very nature, I'm into accountability. I think accountability is a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. I hold you accountable. You hold me accountable because we care for each other. But there is a, a, a part of accountability that, if you're not careful, uh, can be a little strong. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I've related to you, I'm kind of the, 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 the man in our neighborhood that complains about some of the houses and things that are left empty. And so I'm a regular visitor to city council, and I'm hoping I never get to, to a point where I'm just the complainer, uh, but I have something to say and also something to do. You have to be careful about entitlement abuse. Eighth, change irritation. Just the thought of anything changing kind of causes somebody. Do you know that there are some churches, even there's a couple in our association, who say that a person in the pulpit cannot preach in the pulpit unless they are using a certain translation of the Bible? I, I mean, thank God I've never been in any of those churches in my life. Because God's translation process is more miraculous today than ever before. I mean, there are fabulous translations that have gotten better and better over years, not worse and worse. And so to use, I thought it was interesting, I was reading through Betty's notes to me, I thought it was interesting that she gave me five pages of notes to, for her, uh, for her <laughs> funeral. She had it written out, and I, you, for those of you who missed it, I sang four hymns yesterday. I, <laughs> It was, it was quite the time. No, I talked about the hymns. I didn't sing them. And so she had it written out, and she also had uh, this verses that she wanted to be read. And guess what version she chose for them to be read? The English contemporary version. Change irritation. That leads to the next one, anger, what I would call anger mismanagement. Any church that deals regularly with anger and frustration and has this kind of agitation going on underneath it has at some point been taken over by a bully. You give me uh, oh, uh, a week or two in a church just kind of living in it with you, and I can tell you who the bullies are. I can't tell you how to deal with them, <laughs> but I can tell you who they are, and, and they are devastating to a church. They are devastating. Intent, outreach, apathy. When you and I stop telling our stories, when you and I just get protective about me and us and them, then we've lost our outreach opportunities. We've got to be warm-hearted and loving and careful in everything we do. Our mission statement, love God, serve others, and what? Tell your story. 
If you do not have a story to tell, then you need to make sure about your Christian walk. If, if your story has grown cold and old and, and you don't know how to tell it anymore, you need to warm it up. And, and, and the way in which we do that is worship. You breathe in and breathe out that rhythm of worship where God gives you a fresh experience. Church membership is not about an organizational standpoint. It's about a biblical perspective. And that biblical perspective is you give and you serve and you put others first. And that's the kind of what I would call mind over mind perspective that I'm talking about. Mind of Christ over mine. Go down the hallway here and see if you hear echoes of mine in the nursery. Mine, mine. No, the mind of Christ changes how I possess things in church in my life. So thirdly, the marvel of this mind over mind. What's the marvel of it? Well, that passage that we read a moment ago, it's the chief passage to talk about how we transition in our lives from holding on to letting go, to serving and and having that attitude. I've told you that I, on vacation, not this past time, but the time before, I uh, it was before Neva had joined me, and so I was kind of lonely, and I went to a movie one night, watched Sully, and I, I left there with tears in my eyes, because it was such a profound movie. We recently, Neva and I, saw it together because it was on the television, and so um, if you don't know about that movie, it's rush home and, and, and rent it or get it. Uh, it's a tremendous movie, true story. Um, to me, about one of the few modern heroes that we know, Captain Sully Sullenberger, uh, was at the throttle of the Flight 1549 when it landed that jetliner on the Hudson River, saving about 150 passengers in the process. But what I most remember about him was his absolute incredible humility in that. I've seen real interviews of him, I've seen the movie, and I've monitored him. But this is one of the things that he said that I have marked. In an interview after the crash, he was modest about his acts of courage, attributing his poise to the training over the years. He said, one way of looking at this might be that for 42 years, I've been making small, regular deposits into the bank of experience, education, and training. And on January the 15th, the balance was sufficient that I could make a very large withdrawal. Isn't that good? My hope is that you, as, you and me as a church, that we will in fact rely upon the experience that God has given us to be God's people, to be unified, to be connected together, to be loving to each other, to be serving with one another, not only in this building, but outside of this building, in our community, and that we will in fact know that every day Christ has invested into the equity of our lives and we get to draw that out as we serve others. You know how I love stories, particularly when they connect together. Well, I found two this week that I were just marvelous. Uh, I've always been a bit intrigued by outlaws. I'm not sure why, but Al Capone uh, was one of those. If you've done much history of him, he's an interesting guy. He basically virtually owned Chicago at one point. He wasn't famous for anything heroic, I can tell you that. He was notorious in enmeshing himself in the Windy City, everything from bootlegging booze to prostitution and murder and if you know much about his story you know that he had a lawyer that protected him his name was easy eddie and so uh, whenever he needed help he went to easy eddie and he got it taken care of until one day i don't know there's differing uh, accounts and i went to snopes.com to check this out but i'm not sure what the reason was but some say the reason that he wanted to come clean and rectify all the evil that he had done it was because he had a son that was growing up and he wanted, to, he wanted to, to, to give something to his son that was right and honest. And so he testified against Capone. You may know that story. You may also know that within a year, his life was ended in a blaze of gunfire in a lonely street in Chicago. But in his eyes, he had given his son the greatest gift he could ever give him. And on him that day, they found several things, a rosary, a crucifix, and a religious medallion, and also a copy of uh, a, ma a poem clipped from a magazine. And the lines were like this. He said, the clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power. 
to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own, live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in time, for the clock will soon be still. Let me switch over to a World War II, which did produce some heroes, and one such man was a Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. He was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier, the Lexington, in the South Pacific. And one day, his entire squadron was sent on a mission, and after he was airborne, he looked down and saw what no pilot wants to see. His fuel gauge was not where it needed to be, and he realized he had forgotten to top off his fuel. He would not have enough fuel to complete his mission to get back to the ship, and so his flight leader told him to return to the carrier. And reluctantly, he dropped out of formation, headed back to the fleet, and he was, when he was returning to the mothership, he saw something that made his blood turn cold. A squadron of Japanese aircraft was speeding toward the American fleet, and so there the American fighters were gone on a sortie, and the fleet was all but defenseless. So what did he do? Laying all thoughts of personal safety, he dove into the formation of the Japanese planes. He wing-mounted 50 calibers blaze as he charged in and attacking one surprise enemy after another. He wove in and out of those planes and undaunted. He finally, he later found out that five of those enemy aircraft went down. It took place on February the 20th, 1942. And for that, Butch received the Navy's first ace of World War II, and the first naval aviator to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. A year later, Butch was killed in an aerial combat in the age of 29. His hometown would not allow his memory to go. And so if you, walk, if you fly into a place called Chicago and you note that it is O'Hare Airport, you might know who it was named after. But what you may not know is Butch O'Hara was Easy Eddie's son. I read that story and I thought, you know, it doesn't take much of a gift of serving other people to get them to notice him. He must have noticed all the stuff that his dad was involved in. But the end must have lit something in him where he knew he needed to serve. 20 years old, Betty McCoy wrote a poem. I read it yesterday at her funeral. One of the verses says what I needed to say. It was within my heart a gladness, a thrilling joy that will not cease. For Jesus Christ has found me, and he's given me joy. 